Did you enjoy episode 201 of Togetherness? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I agree with you. Um, without further ado, let me introduce Steve Zissis. Yeah. So welcome. Um, Thank you. We're happy to have you here. I'm sure you have a lot of fans in the room. Um, so before we move forward into granular questions, there's an elephant we must address, which is, <laughs> as of now, there will not be a season three of Togetherness, as we found out last week. I know. You didn't know this, but this is the seat of the Togetherness season three protest club. So <laughs> thank you for coming. <laughs> um, but as we were talking about actually backstage, um, HBO is pretty firm on their decision. So we have to, it seems like we have to accept the news and move forward. Um, so just tell me what you do know about the decision and um, you know, you guys aren't always necessarily privy to these last minute decisions, but just let us know what you do know and maybe we can help us heal as we move <laughs> forward. <laughs> well, um, first of all, thank you. Uh, <laughs> because in the context of things like that, that feels really good to hear applause. Um, you know, it's, it's tough to say we're all pretty stumped actually because uh, critically and in terms of our fans, the show's been universally loved. Uh, so it, we were all shocked. We were actually, we were writing the third season uh, when we found out that the plug got pulled. Um, but in, as far as what I can tell you, and this is actually really good stuff to know if any of you are writers or wanting to create shows. <laughs> um, but there's so much content out right now. There are, the industry is so competitive in terms of TV that what we were told, <laughs> basically the subtext was, it's not enough to be a great show. <laughs> Let me finish, I know. <laughs> so in other words, the subtext from HBO, I think, um, and if anyone is here from HBO, I'm sorry. Uh, but basically, your show needs to either be controversial or have some sort of talking point. More um, nudity. <laughs> more nudity. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which I was going to have to do third season, so maybe this is a silver lining. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but... But the challenging thing for us to understand is that our show was a very uh, low budget for HBO. We could do a whole season of our show and that costs less than like the pilot of vinyl. So, um, but you know, but our ratings were not high. But typically that doesn't matter at a place like HBO because ratings don't necessarily matter. But um, you know, there's a lot of changes happening at the network and I know that's not really an answer but that's all I know. That's what goes on, and also yeah. I think international is a big piece of business. Yeah. You think about their biggest shows, Game of Thrones, and it's one of the biggest shows in the world. So I have, I'm not an expert, but I have to assume that that's part of, you know, how much can this show perpetuate around the world? So that could be, I'm literally just guessing about that, so. <laughs> there are um, no dragons in our show. <laughs> <laughs> but there could have been in season three. Could have been. <laughs> Maybe like a friendly imaginary dragon. <laughs> You know? Well, in the Dune revival that you guys did, which you really never got to perform, <laughs> uh, you have to watch season two to fully appreciate the Dune reference. Um, okay, well, we'll just let that settle while we continue on to happier topics, which is how did you discover you wanted to be an actor? Mm. That's a good question. Um, so I guess uh, to answer that honestly, uh, I was always a class clown as a very small child in school, and then I, you know, I, I lost my dad when I was nine, and I think that I, the way of me dealing with that was getting attention from like the girls in class and making them laugh, and I think it was also uh, for a nine-year-old trying to grasp death, which is tough. I think it was a way of me dealing with the pain of losing my dad when I was a kid. So I went to comedy and making people laugh. Um, so I kind of was like a natural sort of clown in the class. And then eventually, once I got to high school, um, uh, 
I was pretty disruptive in class and I was always late and always making jokes. And then I think a guidance counselor was like, I think you need to go out for one of the plays. <laughs> Which was really smart because he saw that it could be channeled to something positive. And then, and then that's it. I just started acting since then, in theater mostly. Um, and I uh, never stopped acting since then. And were there people in your family who were performers or anyone you sort of had a ref point of reference for in terms of the craft? Yeah, that's a really, that's a good question because I brought up my dad. Uh, so my dad didn't live long enough for me to either follow in his footsteps or rebel against him in terms of what I could see. But, you know, I did sort of retroactively find uh, images of my dad acting in plays at like Tulane University in New Orleans and uh, him acting in plays in high school and it was pretty astonishing because of perhaps what DNA is. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so I, I didn't really have a model, but it did seem like there was something in my dad, even though he wasn't an actor. He was just like a businessman. There was definitely something inside of my dad, too, so you never know. And your mom was encouraging of this pursuit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean... Uh, I, uh, if any of you have seen my Big Fat Greek Wedding. I just watched it this weekend, the first one. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen the second one. I, I'm referencing the first, but y the, whole, the whole universe. Uh, I come from a Greek-American family, so uh, you know, three out of the four of my grandparents were immigrants. So when you come up in that kind of an immigrant culture, you basically, <laughs> your parents want you to be a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> so that's kind of, my mom wanted me to be a doctor, so you know, being a lawyer wasn't, I'm being a, I'm sorry, being an actor wasn't necessarily one of the things she was pushing. <laughs> um, but she's been supportive all the way through. And then you landed at NYU for school, and then it sounds like that's where you threw yourself into sort of a professional track. Yeah, interestingly, I did go to NYU, but I didn't go to Tisch because, again, to your question, I didn't have any model in my life that acting could be an actual profession. So I went to NYU but studied humanities and then, but I did all the plays while I was at NYU. So I was like, I was, I was living a double life. <laughs> I, and on one hand I was saying that's practical, that can never happen, that's impractical. Whereas the humanities are super practical for jobs yeah. after. <laughs> I don't know what I was doing, I was 18. Um, but yeah, that's what happened. And, and obviously your relationship with the Duplass brothers goes back a long way. So tell us how you first met them and the nature of sort of how your friendship grew. We all went to the same high school in New Orleans. We went to Jesuit High, uh, which is a very strict, like dead poet society <laughs> uh, type of high school. Um, in, in many ways, it was like a prison, um, which is also great because it's a great place to rebel. Um, but we were in different grades at Jesuit, uh, but we knew of each other. And I had been acting in plays the whole time, so I was on Mark Duplass's radar from a very early age. And then I started doing regional theater in New Orleans, and we took a play to Austin, Texas. And Jay Duplass, who was friends with the playwright, uh, saw me act in Austin. And then we had like a beer that night, and just he liked what I did. And then later when Mark and Jay were making one of their first independent films in New Orleans, they had me audition. And uh, the rest was history. We just started working together and uh, you know, became great friends since then. So then after NYU, were you guys all in touch about wanting to keep working together? And did you move out here right away after school? There was a lot of bouncing around after NYU for me. <laughs> uh, I taught English in Seoul, Korea for a while. I, uh, studied acting in New York. I was doing plays in New Orleans. Uh, but ultimately, I think everything crystallized when I was studying acting in New York. Uh, and I did a short film for Jay Duplass called The Intervention. Um, we were all living in New York at the time. Uh, and then that short went on to win a couple awards at the Berlin Film Festival and the Gen Art Film Festival. And that sort of cemented our working relationship. And was there someone whose career you wanted to try to emulate as an actor? Was there someone you thought, God, if I can really 
nail those kind of indies or get that kind of film work or try to do a TV show like that person that you would be happy if you were able to do that? At the time, this is not good, but at the time I, I had no map. I had no idea. I didn't look to anyone. I was just acting because it was just in me. And I didn't, again, I still couldn't quite see that it could be a career. I just wanted to do it. And at what point did you move to LA to really sort of throw yourself into the Hollywood piece of it? Because you can absolutely act and not be part of Hollywood, but the Hollywood part of it may seem inevitable at some point. I think it was after I acted in a, a movie called Baghead that the Duplass brothers did, which is like a, hor a low budget horror comedy. And then that went to Sundance and Sony Pictures Classics purchased it at Sundance. And um, uh, we got really great reviews and uh, critics were really nice to me. And I was living in New Orleans at the time and it was just a feeling of now's the time uh, to sort of seize a little bit of momentum and that's when I moved out to LA. And at that point, or at, I guess at what point, did you and Mark and Jay start to conceive togetherness? That didn't happen f for a few years after. Um, and togetherness was conceived. I was waiting tables at a Greek, see again the Greek connection, <laughs> at a Greek restaurant in the Grove called Ulysses Voyage, which is a great place, <laughs> thank you. Were you um, hired because of your ancestry? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I mean, I was looking for any advantage I could get to try to get the job. The jobs, the waiting tables, it's hard to find those jobs here. Yes, Everybody exactly. It yeah. might be harder to be a waiter here than an actor. Anyway. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so I was working there and uh, it was a struggle. You know, there were days where I felt like Will Smith in pursuit of happiness where I'm like <laughs> changing clothes in a, in a parking lot going to a commercial audition then having to get to a shift. And I mean, it was crazy. It was stressful. I was definitely living month to month. I would save up by waiting tables. I would have just enough money to pay rent and bills and then my bank account would go back down to zero do the same thing next month, back down to zero, just hoping, hope, hoping that nothing major would happen. Yeah. Um, and, but you were a SAG member at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> Actually, I, I honestly don't remember when I officially became SAG. It was probably from doing a couple national commercials. Uh, so basically, sorry, it's a long answer, but I would come home after working a shift at night as a waiter and Jay Duplass had a newborn baby, Sam, and he was on the, the night shift with his son. Mm -hmm. So I'd get home from waiting tables, and then Jay and I would stay on the phone uh, until like three, four in the morning, and we would start crafting togetherness together. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and initially, uh, the pilot we created was called Alexander the Great, which was based on my character was a little bit different than the Alex you see here. And then we took that to HBO. They loved it, they wanted to work with us, but they said, if you make it about four main characters, it'll give the show more legs. So we agreed. We went back to the drawing board, months, 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 redeveloping the pilot. Finally, we came up with togetherness and the rest is history from there. And how did the show evolve the most dramatically from when they said, yes, we want to do this, to what we ended up seeing in season one? Were there cha a lot of changes that happened along the way? From which point? From when they actually said, yes, the four character model is going to work for us, and you shot the pilot, and then it moved on from there. Uh, that's pretty much the pilot this, that we wrote yeah. is the pilot that we shot, okay. and uh, that was the framework from, from there. And we, we had the first two seasons pretty much mapped out um, and we definitely knew that um, my character for example was going to go through a uh, physical uh, transformation and that physical transformation was that a, a linear transformation from what you were experiencing in your real life or was that something that okay we want you to show up in season one be you know not super fit necessarily <laughs> and we want and I'm not saying that you weren't I'm just saying you know that was a perception no no please <laughs> frankly <laughs> But was that like intentionally we wanted to see you go from that sad guy on the couch in, in episode one until the sort of guy with swagger we see in 201? Yes, for sure. That okay. was, and that had to be 
designed because I had to, you know, be large and in charge in the pilot on season one, and then drop like over thirty pounds over wow. the over the course of season one and then the beginning of season two. Right. So um, I did have help to do that. <laughs> Amanda's boot camp, obviously. Yeah, exactly. Yes, we saw she was very good at her boot camp exercises. Exactly. So let's say we were to experience a season three. Where do you? see the characters have gone in that oh, alternate this is universe. heartbreaking. I know. Well, we, so I don't want to spoil the end of season two, but it is actually, when I watched the finale, because I watched it ahead, it felt like an actual, it felt like a seamless ending. It felt like a nice ending for everyone's characters. But I did wonder, it felt, I did have a bad feeling when I saw it, because I thought this does feel like an end episode. Mm -hmm. But if there were a season three, I'm so curious where they would have gone, because the show did feel like it almost had like a natural close so where do you think what do you think would have happened i don't know i'm gonna unfortunately i'm gonna assume that everyone will watch all the way to the end of season two True. yes i don't want to discourage you guys from so not watching. i yeah. i probably don't want to answer okay. that <laughs> okay fine um, but needless to say season three would have been uh, very satisfying for fans okay. that's all i can say good good answer based on what i the <laughs> feedback i've gotten <laughs> Now, moving forward, where, where are you throwing your energy now? Are you, gonna, are you continuing to write? Do you want to segue more into film? I know you have a film with Will Ferrell coming up, which is never a bad thing. That's always a good, I'm good going resume back builder. To, I'm going back to the Greek restaurant and begging for my, <laughs> for my job back. Please. Greek wedding part three, that could be on the horizon. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a good question, and um, if anyone is aspiring actor or writer here, this is a great question. Um, so uh, what I had been doing on my own is developing another TV show uh, for about five months now. So, uh, and right now I'm actually about to start shopping it around to producers. So the, the best advice of course, and this isn't brilliant, but is to just com always be self-generating, you know, always be generating your own stuff. Mm -hmm. um, because if you wait around and it's not going to happen and no one's going to bring it to you. Also, you know, auditioning is great. It's really challenging, but, and I've ran into this very recently, but I'll go audition for a part and then later I'll find out who got the part. And recently I, I auditioned for something and I found out that Christoph Waltz got it. <laughs> And I'm just like, really? <laughs> like, just like, can I just stay home and play with my dog? <laughs> like, I this mean. This is a feature role, I'm assuming. Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah. just just tell me that homeboy Kristoff is like in the running <laughs> and I'll just stay home. Like, there's plenty of stuff I can do. <laughs> Don't make me get nervous, go to an audition against like a two-time academy. Anyway. Um, well, have you, have you found your stature among casting directors has risen after the show? Obviously, people know you now, and they've, they've watched the show, and they like your work. But, so the show can be nothing but a boon for jobs moving forward. No, for sure. The show has been huge. You know, even though our audience was small, a lot of our audience were industry people, and they've loved the show, thank God. So a lot of casting directors have seen me now. Um, a lot of huge industry people are obsessed with our show. J.J. Uh, Abrams was like emailing us every Sunday. Wow. That's telling us <laughs> how much he loved our show. You're like, show me the love, dude. Yeah. You know. Um, <laughs> Ryan Johnson, who's directing the next Star Wars, is obsessed with our show. So wow. it's just There's like. Star Wars connection. There's a Star Wars has, theme. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, people, yeah, it's... I think there's a lot of relatability. It's, for it's, sure. It's not only a family show, but it is, for better or worse, a very L.A. show. Mm -hmm. So for people who live here and exist in this bizarre world in which we live, I think it's very resonant. This world is bizarre. It's very bizarre. Um, so I actually have a lot of great audience questions tonight, so great. I thought I would just dive into them. So this is from Caroline, and she would like to know, what was one of the best decisions you ever made to advance your career, aside from knowing the Duplass brothers? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> the first answer is start acting. Uh, doing 
doing, if you, if, if you don't have access to TV or film, is to do theater immediately and do as much theater as you can because you never know who's going to see you doing it. Um, it's also the best place to build presence and gravitas and being comfortable in your own skin. Uh, but in terms of advancing my career, oh gosh, I don't know. I, I, would, all, I would have to say self-creating togetherness with Jay Duplass. I mean, we created it ourselves and that t togetherness has been the biggest thing for my career that I've, I've done and it was self-generated. So. And how did you initially get your agent, who you have now? That's uh, always a question people would love to So there answer. was a little bit of uh, agent hopping that went on. So like, you know, if at first all you can get is an agent that is like nice and small, like kind of good, not great, fine, take that agent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then work as much as you can. And then if there comes a time where you outgrow that agent, then you hop to the next bigger agent. And they're, they're even better. But then you outgrow them. And then it's like, okay. And then you hop to the next. It's like, you know, just don't worry about being with one of the big agencies right away when you're first starting. But I would say that it's better just to have an agent. Um, and if you can't get an agent, get a manager uh, because uh, sometimes managers are really great and they can facilitate getting you an agent. And they're more aggrandized to really be on the ball every day working with you than an agent who's juggling tons of contracts and, and other talent. I yes. Guess. Um, so this is, a, this is a question about the show, which is a great question. How much of the show was improvised versus scripted? And this is from Eddie. So all our shows are scripted. They're all pretty tight, but uh, because of what Jay and Mark have developed over the years with their aesthetic, they encourage actors to improvise. So I would say that 15% uh, of what you see is improvised and 85% is on the page. Um, that said, if you've seen our show first season, um, there are entire scenes that are pivotal that actually happened in the moment. Uh, for example, the, the end of our pilot in season one there's a scene where Alex is on the porch with Tina and he starts singing like a little cookie game and he feeds her some Oreos and the whole shape of that scene was improvised and that was the final scene of our pilot so uh, we do allow for improvisation to happen and sometimes we find gold. So the network wasn't discouraging you from improvising, it was just whatever you felt comfortable doing. Yes, that's correct. Um, and on on the topic of Amanda, who I think gives one of the most amazing performances of any woman. I think woman Amanda's in TV. doing like the best work she of is. her it's career in the show. In, incredible tragic comedy, I call it. Oh um, God. She so I think it's Trayvon. Is it Trayvon? The, sorry, Trayvon. Um, just want to make sure I said that correctly. Uh, Amanda Pete is hilarious. How many takes did you have to go through before you stop laughing at how ridiculous her character can be? Amanda, first of all, when the camera's not rolling, her sense of humor is gross. <laughs> She's very goofy. And inappropriate. <laughs> and very goofy, that's the right <laughs> word. Um, actually, when we'd be off camera, I would try to make her laugh, especially if the scene was comedic. Um, my goal would be to just get her to break. Um, and there's another scene from season one where I'm hanging out with Amanda and I'm talking about Peter Gallagher's character. And I start talking about his little dog, like he's a James Bond <laughs> villain. Like that mm -hmm. was all improvised and mm -hmm. she's actually laughing there. <laughs> so um, Amanda's fantastic. I love her. She's and great. She's married to David Benioff, one of the creators of Game of Thrones. So maybe she has to cut through the serious like dragon talk at home with some For groups. sure. Yeah. For sure. Oh, and he also wanted to say that he loves that togetherness can make him cry within 30 minutes, cry and laugh within 30 minutes, which oh, is a thank very you. ultimate so compliment. Thank you. Um, this is all, another great question from Emily. She would like to know, what is it like to, play in, to be an actor playing an actor? And I think it's a great... That's a great question because we see a lot of stories about Hollywood and the actor experience and some of them don't really ring true. And I feel like yours rings very true from what little I know about the crazy life you guys lead. What was that like for you? Uh, it's a little weird. Uh, it's a little meta. Um, I mean, it felt very natural, 
But I guess the where it could possibly get challenging, and we do this in second season, but we show Alex performing as an actor. So it's always tricky territory because as audience members, when we watch Alex performing as an actor, we might be inclined to judge how good he is as an actor within, I can't even keep up with this. This is very meta. Um, but we decided to show him performing. I guess Mark and Jay just had confidence. Because we don't really know <laughs> if he has any skills in season one. Like we don't really see him perform. We just yeah. know he's aspiring. Yeah, we yeah. just hear like that his friends think he's great, which is really sweet. Um, and in season two, he's doing, oh, y'all saw the first episode. Okay, so you see him doing the most absurd stuff but he's like really committed. He's good, he's really good. <laughs> um, I don't know how to answer the question. It's, uh, I guess overall it felt pretty easy and in flow. Well, it sort of segues nicely to the next question from Stacy, who asks, how much of your own ex life experience was implemented in the writing of the show? And I have to imagine you drew a lot from the, the actor side of your life and implementing those moments which are you know, sad and funny all at once. Yeah, for sure, I mean, in you know in the first season when I'm extra large and in charge, I talk about beautiful skinny LA people looking at me like I'm a whale and they want to harpoon me. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, you have of course you have body images when you're an actor, possibly if you're insecure, like me. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then um, of course there's other aspects about the struggle and the fight and the insecurity and the constant. Uh, feeling lost and um, is there going to be light at the end of the tunnel? Do I keep trying? Do I give up? All these types of elements uh, definitely factored into the show from my real life. And would you say an actor's greatest artillery against the mean parts of the business um, maybe is to write? Because at least you're packaging yourself as I'm not just this person on camera. I'm actually, I've created this story in which I can play which I can play myself, essentially, because otherwise you don't have as much control over your own narrative as a performer. Yeah. Um, I think, especially nowadays, like Aziz Ansari did it with Master of None, uh, which is a hugely popular, well-received show on Netflix. You know, for sure, write to your strengths. If you're an actor and a writer, create something that plays to your strengths. Why wouldn't you? That, that's the best thing you can do. Um, you know, I mean, if I'm totally honest, the show isn't like that autobiographical in terms of, uh, I in terms of like the real me, but there's certainly elements that are there that can then be, uh, heightened and, um, you're always dealing with the imaginary circumstances you're in as an actor anyway, so that's taking place. And what would you say are the people or the things or the shows that most inspire you now when you, uh, you mentioned Aziz's show, his, his show is very much in the, the vein of what you guys were doing, sort of drawing from real life, but also being very raw and real. Are there other shows or performers who you look to and you think, wow, that's, I'm glad to be working at a time when that person's working? Um, my favorite show right now is really weird. It's called Baskets, it's on FX, Zach Galifianakis. Uh, the reason why I love Baskets right now is it's really free. Um, I don't even think the show's perfect. Like, I think Zach's actually not great all the time, and he, like, misses the mark and the tone. There's, Very strange tone. Yeah, there's, like, it's a lot of tone mixing, and there are some missteps, but what I love about it is that it does have that. Mm -hmm. So it's completely free, and it's you can tell that it's a pure vision. Um, so I'm, I'm in, I love it, I love <laughs> Baskets. That's my show right now. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of people agree with you. And would you say there's a dream project that you would love to attempt? Is there a story that maybe 10, 15 years ago you wanted to tell that you put on the back burner or a story you wanted to write or something that you had always hoped, God, I really wanna be able to tell that someday. Is there something on your, on your computer that you're waiting to finish? Well, there's a, the main things, in, I mean, I guess I'll just speak personally now. I mean, y'all can leave whenever you want. Uh, They're not leaving. The, it's, it's the stuff that's just inside of me, and I'm doing it now. With the pilot I just wrote uh, deals with mental illness. Uh, it deals with, uh, you know, tragedy in terms of uh, 
you know, losing a parent when you're nine, things like that. Is it a half hour dramedy format? It would be a half hour, you know, sad com. Whatever the word is now we're using. Whatever it's called. <laughs> um, but also has to deal with spirituality, uh, which I'm very interested in, and where religion is these days, and is it relevant, and you know what we keep from it, and uh, how the spiritual realm is interconnected with the material realm, and things like this. Uh, and then the other thing I'm mostly interested in is uh, uh, I, I really want to do something for children. Uh, I go back and I watch episodes of Mr. Rogers sometimes and I just cry my eyes out. And I just like look at the climate of the world today and I'm just like, what exists today that was sort of like a Mr. Rogers when we were growing up? Like a safe haven for kids. Yeah, for that's empowering for children, deals with really tough issues. Um, and I would want to do it um, in a way that is also magical too. And, and, and has a bit of fantasy, I think, too. Well, I think we see from the Dune theme in season two, there's, you guys will see, I don't know if you haven't seen it yet, but yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of creativity that I'm sure you have left in you. Um, and then lastly, you know, the folks in this room just want sage advice from someone who's lived through all these iterations of the actor's life. What would you tell them is, is something that they need to keep in mind when it gets tough? Um, have them keep going and not give up on this. Very easy question, I know. What's the Winston Churchill quote? Never, 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 never give up. That's it, just keep going. <laughs> you know, uh, have fun at your survival job. You know, if, if it's lighting Greek cheese on fire, uh, just have fun with it. <laughs> uh, and uh, don't give up and and you never know, I mean, I, I found, and, and with, without joking, I might be back at a survival job uh, a couple weeks from now, I mean, probably not, but, and that would be okay, and I would just keep going, and I would keep clawing, and keep self-generating, and you just, you just can't give up, you just have to keep going. And, um, and things happen in sort of a, oh God, sorry, things happen in sort of a divine timing sometimes, so like, in human timing, it might not even make sense, but you may not be able to get something when you're 23, 24, 25, 26, but all of a sudden, 27 is the year. You know, like I just turned 40 years old. I've been at this for a while, but it came later for me, but I'm glad that it did, and it all sort of worked out when it did, so just never give up. Great last words, thank you so much. Thank you guys for coming, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.